Despite a rise in women's participation in sports, a large disparity in participation rates um, between women and men still remains. These, the, um, these disparities are prevalent globally and continue to hinder equality in sports. Now, we joined in the hashtag Know Her Name campaign some weeks back, and this was adopted by the Ladies in Sports International, who caught up with Nigeria number one women's singles table tennis player, Edem of Young who is set to be a four-time Olympian after she became the first Nigerian to qualify for the table tennis singles event at the 2020 Olympics Games. My name is Ophiong Edem from Cross River State. I am a table tennis player, the national number one and African number two. I started the journey from my granny's dining table. Like whenever she's out, I have to convert her dining table to a table tennis. And they didn't really support me playing table tennis because all they always say then like, you have to go to school. And sometimes when I go, I get to school. Sometimes I saw table tennis somewhere with my uniform, I will go and play. The process, I have a son, you know. So you, you can imagine the trauma and everything. I was still pushing until the breakthrough came when I won the women's singles. Uh, title. That was when I knew something is about to happen. No matter where you you are on a pathway of life, please don't let your imperfect past hinder the glory of your future. Yes, ladies in sports, what can we do to encourage these women? I mean, when we talk about um, ladies in sports compared to the men, if I ask you now um, to mention Super Eagles players, I'm sure you can mention like 10 of them at a go without hesitating. But when I say, okay, can you mention five Super Falcons players? We get to hesitate a little before we mention these names. I mean, it, we really do not talk about the ladies who um, do sports in Nigeria. What can we do to change this uh, narrative? I, I think you just have to balance the attention that you mm. give to the men. Mm. Uh, the men have acquired some kind of notoriety because of the visibility they've been exposed to. Uh, there's hardly any time Super Eagles is playing even a friendly match when it's not on television. But Super Falcons, they want to play African qualifiers. You struggle to look for the channel to watch the Super Falcons. Yeah. That is how unfair it is. Um, you also have to increase the investment. We, we don't even have a professional female football league. One was supposed to start off um, March. early this year, before the COVID-19. I heard they've cancelled the season mm. as well. So you look at it and then you just shudder to think what would have been. Because like I said, you know, we had this discussion earlier when we were talking about uh, gender discrimination in sports. Yeah. Uh, the issue is that from the 1920, uh, so 1920, there was a robust English uh, female football league. In England, so much so that uh, a record crowd of about 53,000 fans gathered to watch a female football league match on Boxing Day of 1921. Mm. What did the English FA do the following season? They abrogated every form of professional female football. Mm. So since then, since about 1970s, the there was a culture of suppression of female football. Um, anything female sport because they felt it was the exclusive preserve of the male folk. Um, and like I said, you tie it down to the World Cups, the uh, two World Cups. For the men, the, World, the first World Cup was played in 1930. When, that one pales in comparison when you, cons when you remember that the first female World Cup was played in 1991. So look at the age gap. You see that is, uh, that probably accounts for the uh, imbalance between the two uh, sports. Yeah. So a lot of attention is placed on the men. Uh, people come up and say, oh, that the men are actually the cash cow. They generate all the visibility, they generate all the money because of branding. But have you really invested as much as you have invested in on the men? Mm. So these are the issues I think we should address first before uh, comparing the two of them. You look at the allowances being paid to the super eagles. 
then look at what is being paid to the Super, Super Falcons. Mm. Interestingly, the Super Falcons have won more trophies than the Super Eagles. Super Eagles. Exactly. So where is the fairness? Mm. <laughs> you know, I was going to, I was going to um, ask ID about um, equal pay. Do you think that the women should earn equal pay with the men? And I like the fact that Steve mentioned the title, the trophies won by the ladies. The same applies with the US um, female, female national team. team. They've won more trophies than the male team, but the male get to earn more money mm. than the ladies. But do you believe that we should have equal pay for both men and female sports? Well, it's, it's a matter of context. Um, why I would say so is because everything depends on your bargaining tool mm. as the female national team. In fact, the, the court in the case of the United States female national team has come to say that, yeah, you guys earn probably lesser than the men. Yeah. But if you look at all the other allowances, it almost evens up, right? But away from that, my, my grouse has always been the disparity. Mm. It's, it's, especially in Nigeria, it's nerve-wracking. It's painful because if you look at it, we are subjected to the same physical conditions, mm -hmm. the same poor institutional um, situation we have uh, in the country right now, the same issue with sports hooliganism and mm -hmm. all those issues. All of both sexes are subjected to those indicators. And then you're paying one far, far higher than the other. Th those are huge concerns. Even if you don't want to pay them the same, but the disparity should not be so painful like it is right now in mm -hmm. Nigerian football. I, I, have you ever seen a situation where people go to seek for talent, female talents to play in the league? Mm -hmm. It's almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. But you see academies everywhere looking out for guys who can join under 17, under yeah. 20. So that tells you that there's no deliberate effort in the Nigerian Professional Football League uh, to hone talents, um, female talents in mm -hmm. football. And it's painful. It's painful in the sense that, what if I have a younger sister who wants to play football, football. but she looks at the structures, looks at the remuneration, looks at the branding, looks at the hype, and says, no, it's not, it's not worth it. Mm. As it is right now, I cannot honestly say we have a good and a well-structured professional football league for the men, mm. talk more of the women. women. But as far as pay is concerned, the discrepancy is terrible, and we need to address it as soon as possible. And I'll keep talking, we'll keep talking about it until the right thing is being done right here in Nigeria. Well, we spoke with Ibi Doni Aino, and uh, she aired her views on uh, this story. Um, okay, this is, this is a tough one. And as you would imagine, I already have, I already have a bias on this topic. I have a bias on this topic. Uh, I believe that over the years, women have been shielded from the spotlight. Women have been shielded from, from being known. Women have been shielded from being popular. And, and what we see on our screens today is a result of that. Statistics also, also show that for every 12 men that are popular in a sport, for every 12 men that are popular in a sport, we, we only tend to know one woman. Statistics are there to show for it. And recently, I, I found out that the first, FIFA's, the first FIFA Men's World Cup was played in 19, 1930, while the first FIFA Women's World Cup was played in 1991. So that's, that's, that's about 60 years of, of, of people not wanting to see women on their screens, or of people not, not accepting that football is a sport that can also be played by women. So this is this is this is uh, women. This is women having to fight with sixty years of pushing them back. I mean, how do you fight with that? How do you how do you contend with that? No matter how good a woman is, right? No matter how good a woman is, there's always there's always a number of men, you know, that the woman has to contend with. But I mean, this is not a, this is not a fight between men and women. I, I believe that this is this is this actually has to do with the key players in the industry and how they can better the industry. So like I said earlier, I believe the problem we have is acceptance. A number of people have not been able to accept that sports or football or whatnot is a game for, is a game for uh, women. Now, a journalist is more likely to run a, a story. A journalist is more likely to run a story on a man, on a male athlete, than he will on a female athlete because he believes that people are more likely to listen to the story on the male on the male athlete than to listen to the story on the female, and it is actually true. So uh, this is this is where this is where the organizers, the journalists, the this is where everybody, every key player in the industry, this is where we come together to actually better uh, women's sports or to actually better female sports. Now another reason why women are not seen in sports is the level of investment that is actually put into women's sports. 
it's more likely to get a it's more likely to get someone to sponsor a a, a, a male game than it is to get someone to sponsor a female game. And even when you get a, spon a sponsor for a female game, it's a lot. It's usually a lot less than what would have actually been put in the males game. And I believe that the situation on ground today is a result of the level of investment that women get. Now, if, if, if you give women more money to actually push their game, I can assure you that a lot more money will be put into marketing and advertising of the game and the players. And obviously, you know, they'll be able to push the, the, the game of the women. They'll be able to push... You, we will begin to see it on our screens because a lot more money will be put into, into, into marketing and advertisement. Lastly, the number of women in executive positions in, in sports... You know, the number of women in decide, on deciding bo uh, boards in sports is embarrassing. Recently, I found out that uh, since the inception of the USS, so that's the United States Soccer Federation, since the inception of the United States Soccer Federation in 1913, they have not had a single female president. And I'm saying this because the USSF is supposed to sit, is supposed to decide what happens to male and female sports. They have not had a single president. The, the, the first female president uh, is, is um, Cindy Palo, who happened to be the vice president when Carlos Cordera stepped down. And that's why she became the president. So it was not even a, it was not even a direct decision. Bringing it home, the NFF too, which is the exception in 1933, we have not had a single female president. And the NFF board today is currently made up of 11 members. And out of those 11 members, we only have one woman on the board. How do we expect the voices of women to be heard? And the NFF is, is a board that's supposed to sit on the uh, male and female sports. So how do we expect the voices of the women to also be heard? So I believe that this is where, the, this is where FIFA, USSF, CAF, NFF, this is where the government comes in to actually to, to, to make laws or to make rules that allow the inclusion of women on deciding board. So, for instance, for a board that has about 11 members, you ensure that at least four women or five women are, are on that board. You know, this, this, this is, I mean, it's still a long shot. It's a long way to go, but I, I believe that this is, this is a very good place to start.